Tourette's podcast is not a medical advice show. It's a show about experiences. In the course of that, we may talk about medications or therapies or stories from the doctor's office, but don't mistake any of that for medical advice or direction. It's not. Get that only from people or places licensed or certified to give it. Not from a massively fun and action-packed podcast about our life experiences, such as... I don't get the premonition urge or feeling or echo before those ticks. So like for for me, I know some people say they feel like electricity going up their neck right before a tick. I don't really have that. I'll have like almost like an echo, but before it happens in my head or in the body part that's going to be used. This is Tourette's podcast made possible with support of the Tourette Association of America and part of the Geeks Rising Network. Hey, it's Ben and another episode of Tourette's Podcast made possible by the Tourette Association of America. A thoroughly enjoyable conversation today with our guest Raven, who you might know on the socials as Procrastinator. Raven creates informative content on Tourette syndrome to help people better understand it. She deals with a variety of tics, including coprolalia, which actually developed semi-recently for her. She's 31 with a lifetime of Tourette. Our guest Raven is coming up and the conversation is a lot of fun. Real quick though, a listener question from Ivan. Hey, Ben, and I'll just get to the part of the email with the question says, what activities would you recommend to my nine-year-old son to help his Tourette's? And before I say anything, I'll remind that I'm not a doctor of any kind. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a coach or anything like that. I'm just a guy with Tourette's syndrome. And I remember being nine and dealing with it. Of course, just my life in my context, although I hear a lot of people with Tourette talk about this, is any creative pursuit. You provided some, Ivan, you provided me some personal context with your question that I didn't read on the air. So I don't know everything about your situation, but I think I'm answering this the right way. For me, drawing and being allowed to draw whatever I wanted, that was sort of empowering, I guess. It was an expression that I could own. Uh, Playing guitar was huge for me around the age of 10. Not in a discipline kind of way, but in a straight up free form, do it how I want kind of way. Just sort of rock and roll, I guess. I'll just say generally for me, The activities that helped me most and gave me the most sense of accomplishment and power were the activities that didn't have to conform to a convention, really, or weren't there for a discipline. Like earlier in my life, my parents had put me in violin lessons. And although I love violin and I love violin music and I love the arts in general, I couldn't stand the lessons, the violin lessons, because it was too much like school. It it didn't feel like a break. It didn't feel like expression. It was learning somebody else's technique as a discipline, if that makes sense. I don't know if I'm answering your question appropriately, but it it is a good topic. Uh, Listeners, if you have any successful ideas for activities, they may help a nine-year-old with Tourette. That's something that could be a good topic for the Tourette's Podcast discussion group on Facebook. Like if you have a nine-year-old, what seems to, what what activities seem to, uh, to, to help with Tourette in any way? Activities. For me, you know, creative activities without boundaries for what was right or wrong and just taking it whatever direction I wanted to take it worked for me. And when I say worked, I just mean those activities gave me some pride, which I think was pretty important for me to feel. I'm sorry if that's too basic or too broad of an answer. I have a feeling someone else might say sports, something really kinetic. I do recall being that age and getting frustrated with reading because of my tics and my attention. And that was um, an important thing to learn, of course, reading. But just to offset the things that I got frustrated with, creative outlets were and still are amazing on so many levels. So that's an activity that helped me when I was nine years old and still does. So I'd love to hear what other people think about this question, activities that might be great for a nine-year-old, somebody around that age. Of course, I can only speak from my own experience, so I'd love to see some variety in the answers. Let's do that on the Tourette's Podcast discussion group on Facebook, run by the amazing Sophia in the UK. Did you know, by the way, that the Tourette's Podcast logo was on a race car in the UK? Isn't that cool? Um, shout out to Esther Quaintmere for that. She's the driver of the vehicle in question. Let's get to the conversation this week. Uh, Like I said up top, it's thoroughly enjoyable. We weave and meander and we end up covering how to tick freely, being open about Tourette, about coprolalia, and saying something you're surprised to hear yourself, ticking in the car. There's a lot here and it's all a good vibe throughout. This is me talking with Raven. Hello, I'm Raven, um, aka Procrastinator on my socials. I am 31 years old, living in the United States, and I was diagnosed with Tourette's at the age of seven. 
did you first learn that you had Tourette um, at that age or was this something that was already kind of, uh, you know, obviously they brought you to the doctor for a reason, but was it already sort of a part of your life? Kind of. Um, yeah, it, it, it's funny because I don't really remember. Like I've been asked, like, do you remember what it was like? What were your feelings? And like, I just remember it being so normal because my sister was diagnosed right before me. So I wasn't alone. I was never alone. Um, I mean, a little bit now because her tics, she has had them pretty much go away, whereas mine have gotten worse with age. Um, but when yeah. I was a kid, I thought it was like, I thought it was a really cool thing about me. I got to leave school to like go to doctor appointments and then you'd get like <laughs> a little like treat at like a fast food place or something before getting sent back to school. Right. Um, so I never really thought it was anything unusual or I, 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 I felt that it was special and that made me feel cool. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but I, since I had my sister and hers was actually worse at the time, um, it, yeah, it just felt very normal. <laughs> wow. That's funny. Cause I, I totally remember that kind of feeling. Um, I don't know if it added up to actually, maybe it did add up at that time period. I was diagnosed mm-hmm. when I was like six. And gotcha. so mm-hmm. I do remember being in like middle school and elementary school being pulled out, go, you know, going to, uh, the hospital for a, like a full day. I mean, it would be a full day of examinations and things like that and different tests yeah. just to see how I responded. And I, I remember like all the, um, I, I guess you could call them like, you know, advantages or just pleasant memories that I have associated mm-hmm. with those little time periods when I was trying to, I guess my parents were trying to explore what to do about Tourette syndrome in my life. And um, that's something I'd almost completely forgotten about. Yeah. It's so funny when you, especially when you're diagnosed so early, like your memory is not going to be that great for keeping that. Or you, it's just, you have a vibe of how you felt, at least for me. I'm just like, I thought it was cool. They, I would get to be asked questions about myself. And as the middle child, I was like, you want to talk about me? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I, I remember too, um, at being at that age, uh, being pretty young, I didn't know yet that Tourette was something that, you know, I should be, I'm saying this in quotes, but should be ashamed of, you know, or, or yeah. should have some self-consciousness about. D- did that visit you at any point or had you already um, established a pretty good, I say this in quotes too, a pretty good handle around your your Tourette and how you, you know, how it fits with your life? Yeah. I feel like the, the shame aspect comes and goes. Like wh- I definitely remember as a kid, I didn't feel ashamed. Um, the first time I ever felt like some, like I didn't receive the reaction I expected was I was like at an overnight camp for at school or something. And I was making a weird face and someone says, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, it's, it's a tick. And they're like, oh my God, you have ticks? Like, and they, like the bug. And I was like, no, and like, it's not yeah. like that. And, and they all kind of took a step back for me. And so I was like, well, I guess I'm never telling anyone this again. Um, and then, um, mine kind of comes in waves. So I've had my tics be really mild and then almost non-existent and then a little bit worse and then almost non-existent and then a little bit even worse. And then it just, it keeps going. So like, this is my mm-hmm. most recent episode, I would say is the worst. I developed coprolalia for the first time three years ago, um, at the age of 29. So, um, that came with shame, like s- taking mm-hmm. with coprolalia, even though everyone's like either laughing or telling me it's not offensive, don't worry. You say it in a cute voice. So there's no worries. And it's like, okay, nobody's (laughs) mad at me, but I'm really upset because it feels really bad to say. Um, so I had a lot of shame around that for a while. Um, but I feel like I've kind of oscillated back out, especially now that I've, uh, learned more about the tick community, um, through social media, which is so exciting to like meet other people. Um, who are like me, whether or not they have coprolalia, is just really nice to like connect with people. Um, so I feel like that's helped a lot. Well, I mean, wow, you've been amazing. doing a lot of uh, sort of connection yourself with uh, with YouTube and and your social media, which has been really great. I mean, this is how I I learned about you on um, uh, on Instagram, <laughs> and <laughs> you, you know, you, you had done some some videos on like Tourette etiquette and what not to say to somebody with ticks, <laughs> for example. Um, which is kind of a good topic. What, what is something not to say to someone who has Tourette or another tick disorder? Yeah, um, definitely anything about like, just stop doing that. Can't you control it? Anything that is acting like we have a say in what's happening to us. Right. Um, there's a small level of being able to make adjustments sometimes or um, suppress it for a brief while, but that's not the same as controlling it. So right. not um, the same. 
or like I tell people they're absolutely welcome to make jokes, especially the coprolalia, or I'll make jokes too. Like, don't be shy, but also don't do it every single time I tick, because then I'm going to start suppressing in front of you because I don't want to keep getting derailed because you're, you're trying to make light, which is great, but not every single time I tick because I tick a lot. Right. right. <laughs> wow. What right. a cool guy. What a cat. I love cats. One thing I, I saw you say online that you said you do is you'll tick openly around people who don't know you have Tourette syndrome. Yes. <laughs> how, how does that tend to go? Um, I actually have really enjoyed it. I've only done it a handful of times, less than that technically. But um, the first time I did it, it was like my husband's friend from college came over briefly for like 20 minutes. And I was like, you know what? This is my home. I'm going to be ticking. I'm going to say random things sometimes. And my husband, I, he knows like one of the things I've, uh, it's also not to do is don't tell my di diagnosis to other people when I'm in right. front of them too. Like I can speak for myself. So he's right. not going to say anything. Um, and he, it's so, so much off his radar that he's like, Oh, were you ticking? And it was like, Oh, for sure. But like your friend didn't even notice or recently had a game night with uh, my sister-in-law's friends and most people knew, like five people knew and two did not. And I was like, you know, that's good enough for me because those two people get to see and hear me say something alarming. And then they get to look around the room and see that nobody else is alarmed. Everyone else is pretending nothing happened or they'll sometimes giggle and make a joke once in a while, or I will too. And then they figure out what to do without needing the information of what exactly is happening, which I feel like is just like a good skill for us all to have. Um, and yeah, I've, and if someone were to ask me like, hey, do you mind me asking like what you're doing? Like happy to say, but I've so far not been asked by the people who aren't positive or, or who don't know or I didn't disclose this information to personally. Um, I don't know. I just think it's kind of cool. It makes me feel like a bit more normal, I guess. <laughs> like I hate having to like, be like, okay, who in yeah. the room? Like little checkbook, like who who knows and who doesn't? Who do I need to make an announcement to? Like, I hate that. <laughs> right. So I'm yeah. trying to fight back. <laughs> wow, well, I mean, nerd. did you have a time period where you you were um, kind of, you know, hyper aware and, and felt like you did have to, to have to disclose it to people around you? Oh, gosh, yeah. Especially um, in February 2020, which is right before the pandemic. So we can't even blame pandemic stress. That is when my tics came back really bad and the coprolalia. Yeah. And it took me like a year and a half, <laughs> I feel like, to like work through and like, like I was talking to my therapist about it. She's not Tourette's or uh, she doesn't have like, you know, expertise in people with Tourette's, but like, she was just so great to like be able to vent to and being like, I just... <laughs> feel like I have a list of things in my head. And if it's, if anybody in the room, if they know what type of ticks they've heard, because sometimes I'll be able to let out a tick, like the, the nerd tick, right? That's pretty like, that's pretty tame uh, compared to some things I might end up ticking. And mm -hmm. so if I didn't tick something bad enough in front of someone, then I'm still too scared to tick that. Cause then I got to see their face when it happens. And then it's like, I had all this like worry over like somebody getting mad at me, despite them knowing about my ticks or it just occupied a lot of my, um, a lot of my attention sometimes. So I didn't really like going out as much, which I mean, for the pandemic, we weren't really going anywhere anyway. So that kind of worked out. Um, but it, it definitely was a big worry for me for a long time. Murder. Ha ha ha. Copper Lelia, did that surprise you? Um, when you developed it at age 29? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember when I was a kid, I knew that there was such thing as being able to swear with it. And so my mom would, like go to the, you know, go to teachers or go to my friend's parents when, or whoever I was going to be around, if it was possible, somebody might be swearing. She was like, Hey, when my kid's at your house, can you make sure not to swear? We really don't want her to pick this up. She taught me in advance how to rhyme my way away from bad words so that I could work on it if I didn't, before it even happened. And so, you know, making it to like, you know, in my twenties and I kept thinking I was about to like, cause my sister basically outgrew it essentially the ticks at least, um, I was like, it's going to happen any minute now. And then it like got worse. And I remember worrying when it first started, the first tick I had um, in February, 2020, when it came back worse was cough. And not, I wasn't coughing. I wasn't doing the sound of coughing. I would just say the word cough say over the word and cough. over again. And then it was like, oh no, it look, looks like some COVID stuff's happening. And we're like, oh, okay. Like, well, that's good. I'm not actually coughing. So no, I'll just say it. And right. then it started being fucked 
cough. And then I was like, I did this to myself. I was so scared to get it that I did it to myself and it's my fault. So that was also wrapped up with the shame and fear and guilt of like, it's my fault I did this. And now I'm the stereotypical media portrayal that I was like always telling people (laughs) when I told them I had Tourette's, I would be like, but I don't swear. It's not always like that. And now I'm that person. And so I was was a mess of feelings. (laughs) Murder is so cool. Well, does it help you? It, 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 you had mentioned right. earlier, um, you know, sort of ticking openly and not um, but without disclosing to the people around you. Tension tends to kind of put an edge on my tics, um, maybe bring them out more and maybe put me in a situation where I f- or maybe I'm in a situation where I feel like I have to suppress them more. Mm. But does ticking openly without suppressing, does that kind of help the overall situation for you? Yeah. So I think with that, so like the game night was a good example. That was like a couple of days ago um, because the majority of the people knew and half of those people have seen any kind of tick because, you know, it was my husband and my sister-in-law whom I live with. And so they've seen any of the ones that I'm like, oh, I would rather like not have to say that in front of other people, but like they eventually have to come out. And so I feel so much more relaxed and I don't suppress at all. Now, if that ratio is different, like when I go into the office for work, I did a presentation on Tourette's May 2021 for the office via Zoom and it was really great. Had a great response, had great questions, (laughs) had everyone telling me like, hey, if you need accommodation, just let us know. Um, And so when I go into the office, you would think it's like, well, everyone knows, but and, and feel free to cut this part out. But like, for example, I have had ticks where I say like, nice cock, bro. And I don't want to say that to my manager. And so I will right. be suppressing because I'm too scared. I don't know which ones might come out. And sometimes I can suppress and turn my vocals into motors, but that's more uncomfortable. And then I've, I might have a tick attack later, which um, I, you know, I, nobody wants to do that. And so yeah. If I'm able to do the thing where I'm like, most people are aware and these are people I'm very comfortable with. And especially the biggest thing is whenever it's in my own home, um, if if that was that same exact group of people, but we were at someone else's house, I can guarantee I would have been suppressing so much more. Hmm. But because it's my house, like where I live, I it's a safe space. And so it almost is like I almost can't suppress. Um and especially with certain people, like my husband's around, I tick more because I'm so comfortable. And I know if anything happens, he'll be able to help me. Right. Um, especially if like I'm vocal ticking so much that I can't talk back to whoever is asking something. Right. Um, so it is it is a very nice, relaxed feeling <laughs> when I can do that. Nerd, well, what nerd. Uh-huh. A few years ago, uh, it was right after I started Tread's podcast and kind of, you know, coinciding with that is when I sort of opened up publicly to um, people around me. But very few you know, a very small group of people knew, uh, being around my, my closest friends, you know, they heard me ticking more. Like after the podcast started, they heard me ticking more. And it wasn't that they noticed it more. I was ticking more, but it was yeah. because of that comfort level that, nice. um, you know, it, it was just, yeah, it just felt, it makes the whole hangout so much better. Um, yes. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's not like, I mean, I think I am generally like in one of the layers of my mind, always thinking about Tourette in some way, mm-hmm. like it's always there. <laughs> But generally, you know, when I'm hanging out with my friends, I feel, I do feel relaxed and comfortable, even though I do, you know, maybe in those situations in the past, automatically suppressed. Um, just like my brain's like, of course, you're not going to take in this situation. You're, let's just, let's just hold it back. Which again, as you said earlier, is not the same as, you know, making the tick go away or, yeah. um, but yeah, j- just that, that one extra step of just being able to tick and they get it and we can move on. There's nothing, there's nothing to do about it is it's so relaxing. It's so much better. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and like, I feel like it's a a compliment too. I remember at one point in high school, I was taking more at home, which some of what was because I was trying not to take at school, but like my mom kept thinking like, it's me, you're taking around me. Am I stressful to you? And I was like, no, you're a safe person. That's why you get more of the (laughs) ticks. Right. Yeah. It's like what they say with uh, like the uh, immune system is, you know, when, when you um, exhibit symptoms and, you know, sniffling and stuff like that, you know, it's like, no, your immune system is working. It's not like you have a yeah. bad immune system. Like it's, you know, it's, it's kicked into gear and these are the, the signs that it's working. Yeah. Um, what, what do you, what do you do for, uh, is there anything that you do in your life that, you know, that we talked about the people you like to be around? What do you like to do? Is there anything that, that sort of kind of puts your ticks at ease, so to speak? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um... 
I feel like it's changed based on whatever, it's it basically whatever interesting activity or hobby that I have is usually going to be really helpful and calm it down. So um, reading and writing a lot of the time. Um, more recently, when I am streaming sometimes too. Um, sometimes it's worse when streaming, sometimes it's better. Um, so I stream on Twitch and do some productivity hours. So it's like if you need like a study buddy or something, or I'll just play like indie video games. Um, but if they're like scary games, I'm going to tick show a lot. But other times if it's like there's a lot of things to focus on and there's a story and I'm really into it, I almost don't tick the whole time. Um, or doing like different arts and crafts and stuff. Um, and actually, the, when I drive, the only time, I'm not like a big fan of driving. I would rather be in the passenger seat. But when I have to drive, right. I can. Totally fine. Um, I tick more when there's other people in the car. When I And it's all vocal, <laughs> luckily, when I'm driving. Um, mm, but yeah. it's like you said, like it's always in the back of your mind. And so when I'm driving alone, I don't tick pretty much the whole time. Like when I have to return to the office for work, I now live in a different state for my work. And so it's a three and a half hour drive to get to my parents to then commute there the next day. And like, I tick like twice the whole drive. And the only time I tick is when I realize <laughs> I haven't ticked in an hour. <laughs> right. Yeah. Of course. And I just like did it to myself. I'm like, Oh, wait, okay, well, we'll move on. We'll keep listening to the audiobook <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> That's funny. Cause the car for me is where my, my ticks really explode. Um, Ooh. it's, it's like a sort of like a release valve or something. I, I, mm -hmm. I get into the car and everything I've kind of and I suppress less when, when I'm at the office because my immediate coworkers, they, they get it. They understand nice. it. Um, and they've been really supportive about, about all this too. Mm -hmm. But, but when, once I get into my car, it's everything that I was kind of holding back or automatically suppressing. Um, when I say automatically suppressing, meaning I'm just kind of on autopilot and that's what I would do historically in a situation like yeah. that, where say like, you know, like there's a client walking down the hallway and, you know, I'll try to suppress a little bit. But I get into my car and that's where I just explode <laughs> and just kind yeah. of, you know, let all the ticks out um, that we're like fighting to get out that day. But same thing, it's it's all vocal ticks when I get into the car, which um, I think there's a component of that where I like how it sounds in the car. Oh, <laughs> like, nice. There, there's like a, uh, you know, it's, it's like, you know, listening to, uh, I know people who record music say like one of the ultimate tests, whether your recording sounds good is, does it sound good in the car? Um, there's just something about it acoustically and, uh, the tick is like much more satisfying when I'm in my car. Ooh, Don't know why, cool. but yeah. Yeah. I've heard some people say they only have certain ticks in the shower and I wonder if it's the same kind of feedback. Cause I definitely uh. have had ticks where it's like, it's the sound or the shape of my mouth is <laughs> the reason I'm doing it more so. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's cool. Murder is so cool. I love it. The shower. I, I'm thinking about that now too. I, I definitely have some unique ticks. Um, <laughs> that I kind of want to practice now, <laughs> but <laughs> n n n now out in the open, but yeah. D does, does talking about this, I mean, does this kind of edge up your ticks at all? A little bit. And, um, also because, uh, I notice like I suppress a lot more when I'm having an audio only conversation because, or they transition more. So I'm making a lot more faces right now that you can't see because hmm. even though I don't normally make that many, like I don't have that many motor ticks. Um, but when I'm trying not to interrupt somebody, um, especially cause like then the audio will cut in and out and I'm just like, oh my gosh, like I'm going to derail them. And so, um, and just talking about ticks in general. And I was just watching somebody's live stream talking about Tourette's. And so I'm, <laughs> I'm probably just very ticky right now, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of it is me making the uh, silly faces. <laughs> <laughs> wow. What a nerd. Have you had any ticks that you have wanted to uh, or, or tried to actively manage on, in some other way? I mean, her, have you had you know painful ticks or anything like that over time? Um, yeah, and when I was younger, I don't know if what I did to manage it really, but when when my ticks were really bad in high school, it was like almost overnight. It just I had a one head turn tick the night before it started, and I was like, "That's weird. That feels like a tick, but I haven't done that in years." And then the next day my entire body wouldn't stop moving. Like I would get a reprieve for 20 seconds at a time for the whole day. And it lasted a couple of months like that. And it would be like my arms and legs going. Um, and I just was making a lot of jerky movements, which is physically exhausting. I don't know necessarily if I did too much for that. I think we did. We, um, my mom started saying like, oh, if you listen to classical, classical music when you're going to bed, that could help. Or, um, 
I was allowed to like hmm. bring a book to like events and stuff or like family holidays so that I can sit quietly and read because that really helped mm -hmm. manage the tick. So I guess I did do that, that and uh, music. So I always had music going um, because that helped calm me down. And I, if I concentrated on that, then I wouldn't be ticking as much. Um, and then in 2020, um, the vocal ticks have been the majority of what I've had the last couple of years, but I did start off with a lot of motor. And one of them was smacking myself on the forehead. It's like the palm of my hand, specifically like the center had hmm. to hit and it had to make a certain, it didn't have to make a certain sound, but I had to feel a certain way on that part of my forehead. And I figured out if I wore um, like a beanie hat, then it would, you know, lessen the blow. So it wasn't as annoying. And it ended up, I don't know if that helped the tick go away, but, um, I didn't have to use that for too long before the tick moved on. Murder is huh. so cool. Well, you mentioned being able to, uh, sort of transition your tick from one form into another. Is, is am I, did, did I hear that correctly? <laughs> yes. But like, <laughs> I feel like the phrasing is really difficult for that because yeah, I yeah. don't know the magic behind the scenes for why I can do that. <laughs> um, but that's the best way I can think of it is because I'll be like, <laughs> I feel ticky. And if I let out a bunch of vocal ticks, that'll probably help, but I'm trying not to vocal tick. And it's almost like my body's like, it's either, especially when it's like actively ticking. Right. So I'm very, I feel comfortable enough to tick in front of you but I'm still worried about like interrupting or anything like that and derailing. Um, and so if I'm, I call it like my active versus subconscious suppression. Um, so subconscious is when, if I don't feel psychologically safe in a space, then I will start to, uh, suppressing even if I don't want to. Hmm. And then hmm. active is like when yeah. I should be able to, but I'm trying to like, it's like you've got floodgates and you're trying to keep the gates closed, but you have to like open them a little bit to let a couple of out. And for whatever reason, because I'm so focused on not having vocal, it automatically just comes out as motor. It's so like when I mentioned going to weddings, like I will have, like I was like raising my hand a ton at one of the weddings, but I was like, but I'm not saying what my brain keeps repeating in my head the whole ceremony. So I'm still winning. Like, even though I just kept <laughs> having to raise my hand the whole time. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know, but I, I do call it like basically like transitioning or mo changing them into motor ticks, but I'm, I'm not personally actively doing anything. It just kind of happens, but it still feels like I'm doing something because I'm focusing on not vocal ticking. Murder is so cool. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I, yeah. I historically have not been good at this kind of thing. I'm, I haven't tried so directly, but I, I do know when I've tried to sort of mask my ticks, I end up kind of producing a new compound tick. Um, yeah. Like, you know, if I'll, like, if, if I have one of my vocal ticks and I add a cough to it, all of a sudden, okay it becomes that tick plus a cough or a throat clearing mm. um, as like the, 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 the new tick. And I have to kind of do it that way. I, I, I haven't tried so directly to, uh, to try to make, and again, yeah, you're right. This is difficult to phrase because it sounds uh, too magic or more magical than it is, but <laughs> about, you know, kind of transforming one tick into another, so to speak. Yeah. And I've, I've had some more success, quote unquote, <laughs> with um, changing one vocal to another vocal. Um, but usually it's not that I change the tick so much that instead of saying this word, now I say this word. It is um, like, so the example I used most recently was um, I have a tick where I just mutter bitch like a ton of times. Um, mm -hmm. And I was like, oh man, like what if I said something else? And for me, the first syllable has to happen. Because I don't, uh, I, yeah. I can sometimes have like a, I know what I'm about to say, but there's such a small window of time that the first syllable is out before I can do anything. So I have to find a new word that includes the first syllable. And so I thought, well, Bitcoin, that's pretty close. I can do that. And so I managed a little bit and then it became Bitcoin. And I was like, this is, it didn't work. <laughs> it <laughs> and adapted. then I would say all three of them. And I was just like, well, <laughs> now I've just added two more instead of just letting it lie. <laughs> the Tourette Association of America is the premier nonprofit working to raise awareness, advance research, and provide ongoing support for those with Tourette syndrome or a tick disorder. With a network of over 130 chapters, support groups, and centers of excellence, the TAA engages with communities across the nation in an effort to provide tools, webinars, workshops, and support for all seeking assistance. 
As a primary sponsor of Tourette's Podcast, the TAA supports authentic conversations showcasing the diverse representation of the Tourette community. To learn more, go to Tourette.org. That's T-O-U-R-E-T-T-E dot org. The Tourette Association of America. Uncontrollable. Unstoppable. So one thing I liked that you had put on YouTube, uh, I believe it's on YouTube, that, uh, and, and I think you see it on uh, on Instagram or your other social medias, was um, about how to spot a faker um, <laughs> yes. when it comes to Tourette. And spoiler alert, you know, this is, the whole thing is kind of facetious uh, yeah. in terms of the title. Um, but th- that's that's something that sometimes people will write in about, well, I've gotten a few emails about it, about, hey, I think so-and-so is is faking his or her Tourette. And I don't even yeah. want to touch that. That's, that's, yeah. That feels so tough. Cause like, you know, we've heard that people are truly going out there and faking it. And some people have like come out and said like, oops, yes, I was faking it. Um, but to, to decide that as like an armchair viewer of this person, like, it's like, you can't diagnose them. Like you don't really know. And the biggest point in the video I've, I made, um, was that if you were to say, this is the reason why I think they're faking it, you're going to be wrong because I've seen a couple of videos where they name my tics and say, that's why they're, do- they're <laughs> wrong. They're faking it because they had a really long vocal tic. And I was like, man, I can go on for a while. Like, <laughs> and it's not me. <laughs> and it is a tick. And now somebody can see that video and see that that means you're fake. And then they can come over to me or somebody else and say, Hey, I saw that you do that too. That means you're faking it. Um, and so it's just like, like, like I said in the video, like (laughs) if your body can do it, it can be a tick. So anybody could technically be faking it, but like the best course of action is just to believe everyone and be supportive. And if you do not believe them, walk away. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Just put out more helpful info online that people in the track community can use. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially if there's like a, someone said something like entirely um, incorrect about Tourette's, like instead of being like, oh, that means you're a liar. Just say like, hey, here's some information about Tourette's. Like, here's what I have and just share the correct information. Um, I feel like that's just so much better to keep putting out the the the, the facts and, and whatnot while not trying to derail and make it about like, okay, we can all be detectives now. We can all figure it out. Like, who's faking? <laughs> wow, what a nerd. I love cats. They suck. Murder. Let me backpedal uh, just a little bit. Um, when you were Try talking me. about music, and then you were talking about uh, the, the the vocal tick where the syllable mattered, um, these things kind of, for me, go hand in hand a little bit, where my ticks almost have to have some sense of rhythm to them. Like, yes, there's, I talked about the car sound. Like, yeah, there's like, there are the satisfying layers to it, but the elements of my ticks, I feel like they have some right. kind of chaotic rhyme or reason to them, um, which I know is, mm-hmm. but so you mentioned music, like what is it about, I've tried ambient music. It doesn't work. It's got to be rhythmic music. Do you find anything like that with you? I think for me, it was focusing on the words. Um well, which is funny because a lot of the time when I listen to music, I don't always take in the words first. I take in the rhythm yeah. and then I'll decide if I want to start learning the words, if I like the sound of the song. But I think yeah. the biggest thing was having a story to follow. So I listen to a lot of musicals and stuff like that. Um, so there's a story going on. And then nowadays it's like, oh, okay, like, so audiobooks, like I can pay attention to what's happening um, in this hmm. instead. And that I feel like folk, that's the focus I think I need. This is interesting. So about um, a I'm year and sorry. a half ago, the amp in my car that governs the the stereo started malfunctioning. So mm-hmm. I just disabled it and I was going to get it fixed, but I was like, I'll just get a new car at some point. I mean, that was already my plan. Um, so the, the amp never got fixed and I was driving a car without music. And oh. now as of just recent, um, I have a car with music again. And I've not tried to monitor myself to see if I'm ticking more or less in the car. Um, Music does have that attentive element where, you know, and even there's a, with audiobooks and and things like that, there's there's still 
because those satisfy me too. Um, but there's still like a cadence to to the to the yeah. reading, you know. There's still like a like something that kind of it's not just uh, monitor and reading. Like there's there's something that kind of you know pulls you along with some sense of rhythm. It, you know, I, I'm I'm not trying to prescribe this to you, but this is something I'm I'm thinking about for the first time. Yeah, that's cool. I like that. Uh, yeah, I feel like my ticks. I don't know about like the rhythm of things that help calm my tics, but they definitely have a sound. Like you can tell, like after you've, you've hung out with me for a little while, you'll be able to tell the difference between me talking and me ticking. And there is occasions yeah. where someone, I will say a funny sentence because whatever we're doing, and there's a reason for me to be able to say something funny and people will pause and be like, was that you or a tick? Because that really could have gone either way. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> sometimes I'll use like my voice versus the tick voice, but most of the time it's a, it's the tick has a different voice. And it makes me make really weird facial expressions while some of the ticks are happening. Oh. Um, but I've also had some where I have to sound a certain way. So that's where it's kind of like the Tourette OCD where you have to keep repeating the tick, even though it doesn't feel like Tourette's is doing it. It feels more like yep. I have to do it because I'm not doing it correctly. Totally. Um, I had a John Mulaney tick for a while <laughs> and I had to keep <laughs> trying to sound like him. And if I didn't get it right, I had to keep going. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I have a tick that's similar to that. Um, my friend Heather, who's on the the same podcast network, uh, Geeks Rising, she's uh, from New Zealand, and the the way she says my name and the way she says her name have both become ticks. And oh. I have to get the accent to where it sounds yeah. convincingly right, which which I'm not good at, but I get stuck on those so badly. Oh my gosh! Yeah. I had an Irish one. It was like, I had to say a single word. I don't remember, but I had to say it with like a trill and an Irish accent. And I was like, I can't mimic accents. <laughs> right. Yeah. <But> I have <laughs> to. <laughs> yeah. That, that's, that's another one too. I, I, um, I, I will have accent mm-hmm. ticks or, or I'll say something, I'll say a phrase. Guy, I just had one the other day too. Um, I told my friend Haley about, um, when I said the phrase, I had to say the same thing in this sort of like imagined version of what someone from New Jersey sounds like, oh. and like, like not, not dead on. It's supposed to be kind of almost cartoonish. Yeah. So, th- so th- there was like this exagger- exaggerated version of an accent that I had to hit in my head, almost like a voice actor would in a cartoon or something. Oh. And, um, it's, it's, it's interesting what the brain comes up with to get hung up on. Yeah. And, and that actually reminds me of takes I had back in high school. Um, so I was taking Spanish class in high school and I was also watching a lot of Japanese and Korean dramas and Tourette's decided those sounds of those languages are really cool, but we don't speak enough of those languages, but we're going to pretend. And so I would say gibberish with accents and the cadence of the languages of whatever I was hearing in my daily life. And, um, and and I'm pretty sure almost none of it was real. Um, but like, it was the sound of the words. And of course, like I'm scared at like the store. I don't want someone to think I'm like mocking somebody right? with like faking a language, but like Tourette's just really liked the sounds. And so it really wanted me to go for certain sounds or like the cadence of the language. Each one is so specific. Um, there's a different rhythm. And so you could tell the difference between like a Japanese tick and a Korean tick and, and even though it wow. was all fake, fake, it was just made up whatever yeah, sounds it was yeah. deciding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have that too. I, I, um, I'll um, i have sort of this uh, Person. Uh, contrived accent that I will add to, to, to certain ticks. And I think it is contrived as not to come off or be mistaken as offensive. Yeah. Um, Which is, which is something that maybe I have worried about with my, you said your ticks have gotten kind of worse with age. Mine, mm we're kind of level, but I do think over the past 10 years have been worse if, if we measure yeah. it that way. Um, and so I've, I've wondered, and I've had little hints of what could be coprolalia. Um, though, though I, 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 I don't exactly know, you know, I'm, I'm still like, my ticks are still kind of shaping and becoming, and I have new ticks all the time. I mean, yeah. d- does, have you fluctuated similarly where you said it's gotten worse or have you kind of held steady with certain ticks over time? Yeah. So they've changed a lot over time. So I can kind of like jump back to like childhood. So my first couple of ticks were eye rolling, which um, I hate. (laughs) Sorry so much to anyone listening who then got an eye tick just then, because every time (laughs) I mention it, it happens to me like just now. Um, But that was one of my first ticks and like head turn um, and some squeaking like in the back of my throat. 
And so all pretty minor, um, all our teachers were told, so like, they're not like cheating on a test. They're not rolling their eyes at you. Like, cause my sister had same tics. Um, then in high school, after it had been calm for a while, it came back again. And that's when it was all the motor, like very physical, like couldn't stop moving. Hmm. Um, so that was definitely the worst motor period I've ever had. And then in the beginning of college, I had like the first months of college, I didn't take almost ever, like it was so mild. And then it got really bad overnight, basically again. I don't know why it keeps happening. And so I was like, everyone's gonna think I'm fake because they knew me for a month. And no, everyone's <laughs> paying attention to themselves your first month of college. Nobody nobody noticed it, I wasn't ticking. <laughs> but that was the first time I had vocal tics. And this is, this is interesting because you said you were not sure if you have coprolalia. And I would love to talk to a specialist because I haven't been able to find any information online. I also noticed I'm talking very fast. I get excited. I will try to moderate. I do the same. <laughs> my, <laughs> my speaking. Um, but like there's the categories of pal, I might be pronouncing this wrong, but palalia, which is your vocal tape yep. repeating your thoughts or yourself. Um, and then echopralia, echolalia mm -hmm. is repeating some sound that happened around you, like barking back at a dog or repeating a sentence someone said to you. And then coprolalia is what they call the inappropriate, socially inappropriate tics, which people just say is swearing. But what is the category for all of my tics that are not socially, te technically socially inappropriate? <laughs> I am not repeating anybody else. I am just saying, like, there are four friends in my pocket with a British accent. What, who, I've never heard that sentence before. I've had so many one-offs that are like a self-washing pineapple. And you're like, what's that? I've never heard that sentence before. I can't be repeating <laughs> it. It is not technically inappropriate unless you count it's socially inappropriate to randomly say that sentence in the middle of an unrelated conversation. But like, what's that category? <laughs> That's so many of my tics. Is that coprolalia? Should we expand the definition? Like what's going on? Well, uh, uh, we do have people in the audience who don't have Tourette syndrome who listen. So you mentioned, you know, that that sentence had had never come out of your mouth before, or you know, just does it feel random to you? How does it feel when 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 it comes out to? And again, you know, um, not obligated to to explain our diagnoses to anybody, but you know, if someone asked like what that felt like, um, it feels the same as the person listening. Probably, it feels super random and a little bit funny um and because i don't get the premonition urge or feeling or echo before those ticks so like for for me i know some people say they feel like electricity going up their <laughs> neck right before a tick i don't really have that i'll have yeah. like almost like an echo but before it happens in my head or in the body part that's going to be used um, and so if I have my regular ticks that, you know, or, you know, whatever my staples are at the time that they are, those will have an echo. But whenever it's like a really one off, I'll almost never say it again. That surprises me just as much as you, because that comes out and I didn't even know what I was about to say until you're hearing it at the same time as me. And so it is super random. And also I'll, I'll laugh a lot at those because it's like, where did that come from? What does that mean? Like, <laughs> but it doesn't, it just feels like, a I'm, the words are being pulled out of my body kind of, um, especially because with some of my vocal tics, my body will move with the tic. So I almost lean forward and my head kind of juts out a bit. Like I'm physically, the words are being pulled out of my mouth. My body's kind of miming that. Murder is so cool. I love cats. Murder. That's so interesting. Murder. That, that it, it does kind of feel like when I have a new tic, sometimes I'll have just a brand new tic, you know, that comes out of nowhere, doesn't seem to have any relation to the other tics mm -hmm. I have, doesn't feel adapted from anything. Um, and it does feel completely weirdly random and it's like, was that a tick? Yeah, that was a tick. You yeah. know, like you, you kind of know it when you feel it. That, that is so interesting that, you know, you, you could have, I mean, this is material that is, uh, you know, words, you know, they're in your head, they're being assembled Yeah. and you get to experience it as I'm, I'm trying to kind of go through the, the head of the listener. I mean, th is that fairly said? Yeah, I would say, um, because that's what it sometimes feels like is like Tourette's has access to your brain, right? So it knows all the words, you know, um, and there'll even be times where I've heard a word one off. And if you ask me in that moment, do you know what this word is or what, who this person's name you just said? I'll be like, I recognize that I know the word of a name, but I don't really remember who they are. But Tourette still has that ac access. It, it will right. still make me say things where I'll even be like, I have to really quickly look up the definition of that word. Hold on. Do I, did I say something bad? Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any um, 
Brian. questions or final thoughts or anything that we should have covered but didn't, anything we got away from. I, I want to make sure if, if there was something I didn't ask that you came prepared to talk about, um, I, I definitely don't want to uh, leave anything neglected. I just find the video editing aspect really fun and interesting, seeing different tick or Tourette advocates in their videos and all of our different styles. Because like, yeah. especially with coprolalia, like I'll cut out ticks on purpose, but at the same time, I'll sit there and struggle and be like, well, it still happened to me and I'm supposed to be demonstrating what it's like to live like this. And so there's like a balance that I'm still working out sometimes on like, I have a lot of swears. Should I censor that in a funny sound effect way or should I cut it out or should I leave it be? And so you'll see over time in my videos, I don't have a consistent style for how I like manage the takes because I'm just like, I don't really know. But sometimes I like having fun with it. I think one video I did <laughs> Pokemon sounds instead of <laughs> the swears right. or something like that. Um, but and then other people I know, they'll almost fully cut out their takes because it derails your point. I want to say something and it's not letting me say something. Right. Um, and so I don't know, I feel like that kind of aspect and like the creation um, also feels difficult because there's a couple ideas I have to be creative and play with my tics and share that publicly. And then I worry about people being like, you're not supposed to have fun with your tics. You're actually perpetuating this really negative thing or like you're making light of it and it's a serious condition or whatever. And it's just like, man, I just want to have fun with whatever my body's doing. Like, <laughs> I want to exactly. draw a funny picture of a self-washing pineapple. Like, let me be. <laughs> 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 well, it's, it's your thing, you know, like it's, it's good to have, have community and convention and ethics and everything like that. But I mean, when it comes down to how we want to regard ourselves with our Tourette, I mean, that's completely up to the individual and, and, and what your outlets, you know, are going to be. I love that you're doing video editing. That's, that's something I, I do in my day job and don't do enough in my personal life, you know, when it comes to sharing info. Yeah. yeah and you might've, you might've just said this, but just to kind of, um, how do your tics handle, uh, creative moments or, uh, for me, they kind of, they ease out, you know, like if I'm really yeah, stimulated and I'll start ticking, but, um, but for the most part, if I'm creating and I'm in that flow state, I at least don't notice my ticks. Yeah. I definitely get to that flow state too. I like, I like that phrase. The, um, you especially notice like right now, whenever I'm talking, I'm not getting interrupted by myself as much because I'm focusing on what I'm trying to say. So in certain videos, especially if I have a script or something, I'll be focusing on that. Um, and so I'll only tick at the end of what I'm about, what I was saying. Um, there are times where I get interrupted and those are the times where I'm usually not using a script. Uh, personhood sucks. <laughs> the vague bullet point. Okay, I'll just go for it. And so, especially in my most recent video, like there's a couple of times where it like, I'm in the middle of speaking and then Tourette's just like <laughs> bursts out with something and fully interrupts me. Um, yeah. But uh and, and I also get tickier, I find, right when I turn on the camera. And I'm like, I, and I always am like, ooh, Tourette's is like excited. We're going to talk huh. about it. We're going to like, <laughs> yeah. it's just time to shine. Like, <laughs> Everybody's coming out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow, what a nerd. I love cats. Murder. Yeah. I, the, the same thing happens to me if, if I uh, um, maybe start editing or if I start to do voiceover, which I sometimes do at my job. Um, like, yeah, I definitely have like a little bit of, uh, performance, <laughs> you know, it, it just, it just kind of comes out for a minute and then I'm kind of good to go but when I start reading the script and then I'm, you know, okay, like I can, I can kind of get through this. The, the automatic brain starts to, to, to kind of pick up and, and my tics, you know, just, they, at least, like I said earlier, at least are, are less noticeable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I definitely have also felt that with like, I'm sending a voice recording on WhatsApp to friends. And so the first couple of seconds are me ticking before I get a turn to talk. <laughs> oh gosh. Yeah. Th there was a, a new update. I think it was the new update on uh, the iPhone voice, um, memo thing. I don't like it oh. you know, because it, it gives you, um, it's too easy to send a message that I've derailed by ticking oh, where yeah. I'll be in the middle of a sentence and I'll be recording a message and then I'll, I'll start ticking. I'm like, okay, well, I got to scrap that and start the message again. Um, it's it's so easy to accidentally send the message that you didn't mean to send or you bailed out from because of uh, ticking. This is, uh, huh, I wonder if anybody else has had that, like a, a similar kind of frustration or experience with uh, accessibility. This just came to mind. It's funny. That's a really good point. Um, and one that probably wouldn't have occurred to me because the only people I send voice notes to through WhatsApp or whatnot 
are my best friends from college. And I'm like, yeah, you guys know me. I don't really they care. Here, enjoy. <laughs> right. Yeah, they get it. You know, they, they get the yeah. context. Well, it's, it's because, I mean, you've been so great at, right. I think, messaging and educating and, and, and even just kind of like letting it rip, like, like you said, <laughs> where you, you don't have to, you don't have to disclose, you know, if you're on your turf, especially, I mean, anywhere, but, but, you know, in a place where you feel comfortable and yeah, there are people over, I'm going to tick like, that's, that's awesome. I love that. Yeah, thank you. But yeah, this has been a lot of fun chatting. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, I really appreciate you asking me on. This has been great. And it's so fascinating, too, to hear other people's stories because we're all so different. And so even though we all have, you know, as far as like people who are have Tourette's, we all have the same diagnosis. It's going to look so different person to person and yeah. lifetime within your lifetime, right? Because mine has fluctuated so differently. And it's such a different experience than even my sister who also has it. And there is like just no way of knowing what it's going to be. That's why I like like calling like Tourette's like, you know how certain things can trigger your tics and you're like, oh, I, I will sometimes point it out to people like, oh, I did that because this thing happened. This yeah. loud noise happened or I didn't expect the cat to be sitting there and it scared me. Um, and there are other times where I'm like, but you cannot assume you know the secret reason why I ticked because the biggest element of Tourette's is the chaos element. It does whatever oh, yeah. it wants, whatever it wants. <laughs> <laughs> Nerd. That's so true. Thanks for listening. Thanks so much to Raven. Check her out on social media at Procrastinator. That's at P O E C R A S T I N A T O R. At Procrastinator. She's on YouTube, Instagram, and so on. I'll have those links in the show notes with this episode at Tourette'spodcast.com. Thanks as always to the Tourette Association of America for making these conversations possible. Tourette's Podcast works with the TAA to share information and educate people, including newcomers with new Tourette diagnoses and their family and friends. Everybody is welcome to Tourette's Podcast. The Tourette Association is online at Tourette.org, where you can register for upcoming events, including webinars. It's where you can find a provider if you need one. If you click the button labeled Tools and Info, you'll find a whole directory, like an encyclopedia of Tourette info. You can find a fact sheet on 504 plans. You can find resources with regard to things like bullying, on comprehensive behavioral intervention for tics. You can download that Tourette iceberg graphic that's so popular with the community. It's a cool place to poke around just to see what you can find because there's a lot there. And that's the Tools and Info button at Tourette.org. Thanks to the Tourette Association for all the support. Thanks also to Bandrew at Geeks Rising. That's the podcast network that connects Tourette's podcast to a general listening audience. So we're not just talking among ourselves in the community. We're talking to a bigger audience. And that's, of course, important to bring stories of lived experience and real world context to people's understanding of Tourette syndrome. Thanks for listening. And we'll be back again soon with another episode. This is Ben Brown.